So hello everyone and welcome yep. to the first 2015 winter webinar series for continuing education for certified nutrient management consultants. Dr. John Spargo will be introducing the topic of soil testing for effective nutrient management and Dr. Trish Steinhelber will be discussing the rational use of plant analysis. Uh, before we begin, Will you all please enter your full name and nutrient management certification number in the chat box? This information must be accurate in order for you to receive credit for attending the webinar. So make sure you go ahead and do that at the chat box to the lower right hand corner of your screens. Wonderful. Alrighty, our first speaker is Dr. John Spargo. He is a director of Penn State Agricultural Analytical Services Laboratory, and today he will be presenting his presentation titled Soil Testing for Effective Nutrient Management. Dr. John Spargo, welcome. Thank you, Nastya. Is everybody hear me? Yes. Wonderful. Good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> I think uh, I hope everybody's inside and, and, and warm. It's a, a blustery 14 degrees here in State College this morning. Uh, so what I've put together, it, probably going to take the, the full hour. Um, I, I want to say that right up at the, at the front, because we're doing this remotely, we don't have the opportunity to interact. All of my contact information is here. Um, if you have any questions you'd like to follow up with me uh, that you don't have time to ask today, uh, please feel free to contact me either by phone or, or email. So what I put together is basically a, a, an overview of, of some of the, the fundamental principles and, and practices related to soil testing. I'm going to try and, and stick with the more practical aspects of it, but I am going to get into some of the, the basic theory. So we'll, we'll go over some of the chemistry, but I promise it won't be too painful and all towards, I, I think, uh, a, a meaningful end. Um, so just to start off, I just want to define what we mean when we talk about soil fertility testing. I, th I think most of us think about it as simply a, a measure of the ability of a soil to supply essential nutrients. And I think that's, that's reasonable and accurate, but what I'd like to argue is that in reality what we're doing with soil fertility testing is, is trying to predict the probability of a profitable response to fertilizer and lime. And that's really my, my take home message for the day. And, and, you know, if, if you take one thing away from this, I, I hope it's that. And one of the reasons why I think this definition is important is because, you know, simply by looking at the term probability, it infers that there's some uncertainty, and, and we need to recognize that. And I'll, I'll get into some more details of why that's important as we go along. So in terms of the, the fundamentals, I think we can, we can break it down and look at these four individual aspects of soil testing, each being uh, equally important, the sampling analysis, interpretation, and recommendations. I'm probably going to spend the most time uh, today talking about sampling, and the reason is is because it's generally the most limiting factor, often recognized as certainly the most significant source of error in, in soil test results. It's important to recognize that the validity of, of our results and recommendations are, are really going to be a function of the quality of the sample we can collect. So it's important to take all the necessary steps to obtain a, what is a, a truly representative sample. To illustrate that, we can think about if we collect one soil sample to rec represent, you know, general guidelines is no more than about a, a 10 acre uh, field. That would represent assuming 2 million pounds per acre for a slice, so 6 inches deep. In the lab, most of our nutrient extraction methods only use about two and a half grams of soil. So, in that two and a half grams of soil, in that soil test, you know, that that's just going to represent or could represent as many as 20 million pounds in the acre for a slice of a 10-acre parcel. So, important to get it right. And when we're thinking about our soil sampling strategies, it's important to recognize that soil is variable, and it varies on different scales, from macro variation all the way through micro variation. So the macro variation, these are the variability associated with different soil types, landscape position, previous management, uh, 
those types of things. We think about uh, more of the, the, the meso variation or intermediate. This is going to be more associated with uh, fertilizer application patterns such as you know banded application in the row and even broadcast applications uh, as well as, as previous crop rows. And then micro variations be more associated with depth stratification, uh, crop residues, and, and just soil variability on a, on a much smaller scale. So we'll talk about strategies that we take to, to manage for variability in each one of these, at each of these levels. So first, talk about uh, defining our, our sampling area. And this is really the, the, what I would consider the traditional approach to soil samplings. We want to collect composite samples by soil type or soil series. Well, the goal here is to go out and first identify areas within a given field with those similar soil types. So what we want within a given sampling area is soil texture, color, slope, drainage, previous management, all to be the same throughout a given area. And you know we can use uh, uh, just site history of, of you know known areas where we have different management, such as I've illustrated here in the in the top right of that figure, or you know even NRCS soil survey maps to identify different uh, soil series and map units. And then within each of those areas, we want to go in and collect a, a composite soil sample. And general guidelines is that we want a, a composite to consist of at least 15 soil cores uh, to, to form that composite so we've, we've gotten you know, a nice representation of that entire area. And then the important thing to keep in mind is that we want to avoid any unusual or trouble spots and either leave them out of the sample completely or if we're going to sample them, sample them separately. And then of course the, you know, it's important to, to keep good records of so that A, so that when we get that soil sample report, soil test report back, we know where the results, uh, which area of the field the results uh, correspond to, but also so that we can go back and, and uh, later years and collect soil samples and monitor how, how uh, fertility levels change over time. So, oops, back up a minute. So the, the other, <coughs> side of that is, you know, with the advancements in, in variable rate nutrient lime application technologies, there's there's certainly a lot of potential to take advantage of more precision-based sampling approaches. So, you know, probably one of the most uh, intensive examples of that would be grid point sampling, where we simply take a field and, you know, basically ig ignoring where the different soil types are and instead set, you know, break the field up into arbitrary subunits based on a, a specified grid pattern. And one of the sources of debate in, in this is often uh, what, what's the right size grid? Uh, how large a, a, a grid do we want to use in order to accurately capture that variability? And this is sort of a catch-22. When you look at the, the general guidelines, it's typically you know, suggested that we go with anywhere from a, a one to two and a half acre grid size. I've even seen up to four and four and a half acre grid sizes. And you know, I've, I've been asked what's the, the, the best size, and really it kind of comes down to just how variable is the soil is. And, and the reason I say it's kind of a catch-22 is because you don't know how variable it is unless you've used a very intensive grid. So kind of a one of the most challenging aspects of, of this type of sampling. Um, so getting away from that and, and kind of looking at, you know, so how do we do it once we've established what you know we think an appropriate grid size is, we do is go in and around each of the these grid points, collect a composite sample in generally an 8 to 10 foot radius circle. I've seen larger and, and smaller used um, around these, these geo-referenced points and collect a composite sample there. And then we take our results and recommendations and extrapolate it between the points in order to, to determine our variable rate applications. Um, I don't have a lot of practical experience with this. I've certainly uh, looked at the literature on it. And, and have worked with uh, a number of colleagues that have done some work with it. But I did have the, the chance to work on a project this summer. It was actually a demonstration project we did in one of our fields out at uh, Rock Springs, one of the Penn State uh, research farms. I worked with uh, Rick Day, one of my colleagues here, that has a lot of experience working with geospatial information. And 
we went out and collected uh, soil samples from a, a hay field. We were going to have a field day just to kind of illustrate some of these principles. And we collected soil samples on a quarter acre grid uh, basis, so really intensive soil sampling. And the goal here was really just to look at how variable the, the soils were. <clears throat> here I've, at each of these grid points, collected a soil sample. And I presented the, uh, this is the Malik 3 extractable K. And, and we certainly saw a lot of variability ranging everywhere from 126 parts per million here in the south uh, west corner of the field up to or down to uh, 29 parts per million here along the, the northern edge of the field. Um, so we certainly saw a lot of variability. And, and you know, if we were to uh, composite all of this into one single soil sample, you'd certainly get you know, a, a, a much different result. And we can look at what the impact of that would be on recommendations. So this is the fertilizer potassium recommendations uh, for field corn based on those soil test levels. And you can see that you know, down here along this uh, southern edge of the field uh, where, where the soil is tested much higher, we had a much lower potassium recommendation. And then here where it tested lower, we had a, a much higher recommendation. So again, if, if we were to have pulled this all into uh, one composite soil sample, we would have ended up over fertilizing these areas and under fertilizing these areas. So one of the things I, I, uh, I wanted to look at in, in doing this is how does this variability correspond with the, the different soil types in the field? So we pulled up the NRCS soil survey. These are each of the, the map units in that field. And here in the brown, yellow, and, and reddish areas, this is all Hagerstown at different slopes. Down here in the low, in the bottom mm -hmm. line, this is a, a, a Nolan. Mm -hmm. And then this is a, in the higher part of the field, this is a, an Opequan Hagerstown complex. This is generally bench soils, really shallow and, and droughty. So if we just look at how this pattern corresponds with what we saw in extractable K, we certainly see some similarities there. Um, you know, it, it's not perfect, but the reason I wanted to point this out is because if we had gone into this field and collected soil samples based on map unit or even soil types, we would have captured, I would say, at least three quarters and, and maybe a larger percentage of, of that variability just by taking the, the traditional composite by soil type approach. The other piece of that is remember that in order to develop this map, we collected soil samples on a quarter acre grid, which is much finer than, than I think is you know, practically feasible. Um, if we'd gone with a, a one acre grid, this pattern would look completely different and, and we certainly wouldn't have captured all of this variability. Um, and if we'd gone with a two and a half acre grid, this field's only 12 and a half acres. So maybe we split it into four. Uh, you might as well have just composited the whole thing and collected a single composite sample. So that's one of the, the, the challenges there with grid sampling. Now, you know, the other concern that I think a, a lot of folks have, and I, th I think it's probably justified, is that you know the NRCS soil survey maps are, are uh, I don't want to say inaccurate, but I will say they're, they're uh, it, at least the boundaries are often uh, you know, a, a guesstimate at best. So you know the, the question is is you know are they, are they really accurate enough to, to base precision soil sampling on? And I think it's a valid question. One of the approaches that folks have, have suggested that may help refine that is the use of uh, these various instruments. It uh, measures electrical conductivity out across the field. And there are a number of, of uh, consultants using them. We actually called in a, a friend of ours that works with uh, Helena, uh, who's using these units to des develop <clears throat> these management units where they go out and, and do uh, intensive soil sampling within each of these different zones defined by the various. And uh, the key thing here is measuring electrical conductivity. And the electrical conductivity is especially sensitive to particle size, so especially clay content. So the higher the clay content, the higher the EC. And you can see the values here. It's just a relative number. And the goal here is just to separate out you know, coarser textured areas to finer textured areas in the field. And again, if we, if we look at where these uh, finer textured soils lie and then look back at, at soil series, that, that it, it does do a pretty good job of capturing at least that OPEC one. And you do see some of the differences that show up on the map here. So 
I think it's doing a, a reasonably good job. And we actually were able to overlay this with uh, that, that really intensive soil uh, sampling. And they, they overlaid pretty well. So another approach to defining those, those uh, sampling areas are management units to help improve the, uh, the accuracy and precision with which we uh, analyze soils within a given field. Uh, you know, I could probably spend uh, the entire hour just talking about you know, all of these different more precision-based uh, sampling. I, I really just want to just sort of plant the seed and acknowledge that it's there. Um, this cursor out of the way. So <clears throat> the other aspects of, of soil sampling in order to manage that variability is, is we need to think about uh, sampling depth. And it's important to recognize that uh, all of our interpretations and recommendations are, are based on sampling the furrow slice. Uh, for, for routine analysis, we generally recommend a, a soil sampling depth of a zero to eight inches, maybe no more shallow than zero to six inches. And, and the reason that is is because soil properties tend to be stratified. And it's especially true you know, when, when we look at no-till soils because you know, in a no-till situation, we're applying all of our nutrients and lime to the soil surface. So all of those properties tend to accumulate there at the soil surface. <clears throat> so if we're sampling too shallow, our results end up being uh, skewed high. Likewise, if, if you know, if we if we push through and, and get through the the plow layer and into the subsoil, then our results end up being uh, skewed too low. So, important to not not only use the the appropriate sampling depth, but be consistent in that sampling depth. Uh, to illustrate this, we can look at some data that was summarized in a a really great literature review by by Scott Murrell, where he looked at a study that was conducted out. I believe this is in Indiana, um, and <coughs> I looked at potassium stratification after 10 years of continuous no-till management and sampled it at various steps. I think they were in, in two-inch increments and then mapped out the concentration gradient of potassium from the soil surface down to a depth of, of 10 inches. And you can see that that ranged everywhere from 580 parts per million all the way down to 160 parts per million. It's almost a, a four-fold difference between those uh, the surface and, and uh, 10 inches. So, you know, again, if, if we're to sample those too shallow, we're going to get a, a much different number than if we sample to the appropriate 8-inch depth. Important to keep in mind. Um, in terms of sampling frequency, uh, general guidelines suggest that once every three years is generally sufficient. Um, you know, we can always think of exceptions to that. You know, for example, you know, more intensive sampling may be warranted where we're trying to diagnose uh, a suspected nutrient deficiency or, or maybe a trouble spot out within the field um, for a certain non-routine tests such as the uh, pre address nitrate test or the, the fall nitrate test before wheat. Um, and anytime we're, we're getting ready to make major management decisions, especially those that, you know, get away from, from tillage such as moving to a continuous no-till system or, or planting a perennial crop. Um, in terms of timing, uh, you know, if, if we're in a situation where we don't have a current soil test, uh, I think the best time to sample is, is arguably right now. And it, I don't think it makes any sense to apply lime or fertilizer without a, a current soil test report. Thank you. And I, I, I think that that's, uh, I think that we all, I hope we all appreciate that. Um, um, so for, I guess I be for routine that analysis, <laughs> I, I think fall is generally the best time of year. and, and there are a couple of reasons for that. One is, is you know, just simple logistics. It, it gives you the, the winter months to order materials and, and address any major fertility problems, especially you know, things related to yeah, thank you very uh, much. managing soil city so we can get a lime application down in the fall before planting our crop in the spring. Um, but there are also physical and chemical reasons for doing it. Bye -bye. And we can look at some more data. Uh, we do recognize that, that soil test values do vary over the season. And one of the, the best illustrations of that is, is potassium, um, which I've illustrated here. But uh, before I forget, you know, pH and phosphorus, uh, we also see those vary through the season. Um, so looking at, at this data, again, uh, summarized by Scott Murrell, uh, this is 
three years worth of data where they went out and collected soil samples from plots where fertilizer was applied or omission plots where no fertilizer was applied and collected soil samples every month over a three year period. That's what we he's uh, illustrated here. And so we can look at the, the variability throughout the year. Um, let's first look at this uh, unfertilized, these unfertilized plots. And we can see that potassium ranged, potassium levels ranged about 25 parts per million and peaked somewhere in early spring around March and then their minimum here in early fall. <clears throat> Again, you know, it, it's only a 25 part per million range, uh, and when you look at the variability within month, uh, you know, oftentimes ex exceeded that that range. But but we do see that they they vary. When we get into the fertilized plots, we we do see that the the range is much higher. But most of that is probably due more to the the application of potassium. Uh, you see this big peak uh, right after potassium was applied. So there are a number of reasons for this, and, and I'm not going to go into all of them, but I think the, the one you know, that, that sort of uh, makes the most sense and I think is probably the, the, the most significant is simply crop uptake. Crop uptake and then uh, removal of the, the nutrients from the harvested crop. And then the subsequent release, this is especially for potassium, release of those that potassium back into the soil as the crop residues decompose over the winter. And that's why you see this this big increase over the, over the winter months. So, you know, the question is, you know, so how do we manage that? You know, it, it's probably not feasible, especially for consultants to collect all of their samples, you know, in the fall, which is, you know, probably the best time of year uh, in order to get a, a, a good average measurement of the year. Um, if we want to be able to track nutrient levels uh, over time uh, and try and minimize the, the variability associated with this, you know, this seasonal variability, the best way to manage that is just be consistent. So try and sample, you know, each of your fields within the, the same sampling time. The other important thing to point out here is that we, we really want to avoid sampling recently fertilized soils um, because this is really a, a, a false high that we get immediately after fertilizing. And just as a, a rule of thumb, I think it's a good idea to wait at least six weeks after a fertilizer application before going out and, and sampling. Um, probably better to, to, to wait you know, at least the whole growing season. And that's really the, the thing that why I suggest fall is, is really the best time to sample. Um, in terms of, of tools, you know, generally the most effective tool is going to be a, a, a soil probe. And the reason is, is because it gets a nice uniform slice uh, from the soil surface to, to depth. Um, soil augers also work reasonably well, uh, especially in really rocky soils. Um, more and more, uh, the crop consultants that, that, that I've worked with are, are using more of these ATV mounted uh, hydraulic samplers and and you know, not only is it uh, they're a lot faster it, it's also uh, you know at the end of the day you're, you're not wiped out um, this is uh, Jesse Weaver I got to do a, a project with this summer and he's working with these uh, these Wintex samplers and I was looking at the uh, the literature on these things and I, I want to say that the uh, Literature says they're capable of collecting up to 450 probes an hour. So if we had uh, 15 subsamples or soil probes per sample, that'd be 30 samples per hour with something like that. I, I don't think I could keep up with that by hand on, on my best day. Um, and then in terms of, uh, you know, once we've collected all of those composite samples, I think one of the most critical uh, steps in, in getting a good representative sample is to take all of those cores, combine them in a, a five gallon bucket, and then mix them really well. And when you think they're mixed really well, uh, keep on mixing because that that is the the step where you know we start looking at the lab only wants about a cup of soil, um, so you know you're good, you're almost always going to have to subsample it if you've collected 15 to 20 soil cores, um, and this is where we start getting into that that micro variability. Uh, becomes a factor. So we want to make sure that we've broken up all of those clods, pull out all of the, the sticks and stones out of there, and we've got a nice uniform subsample to submit to the lab. <clears throat> uh, 
All right, let's shift gears and talk a little bit about soil analysis. So, in the Mid-Atlantic, when we, when we say routine soil analysis, it generally includes the following. A measure of pH and exchangeable acidity, probably the, the two most important measurements we can get on a soil test. Extractable phosphorus yeah. and potassium oftentimes includes calcium magnesium, an estimated uh, measure of CEC and base saturation, uh, and may or may not also include extractable micronutrients and soil organic matter. And I'll talk about uh, why it may not include micronutrients. Um, before we delve too far into this, this is where I want to talk about some of the more theoretical aspects of, of soil testing. Um, it's a simple but I think uh, an important concept, this notion that plants absorb nutrients dissolved in soil solution, all in ionic form. But our focus is often on this total, total quantity or total amount of nutrients present in a soil. But the ability of a soil to supply nutrients is really determined by the release of those nutrients in the soil solution, we call the, the soil uh, in, intensity. And we can think about this relationship between quantity and intensity as simply uh, uh, a description of the soil's ability su to supply a given nutrient, or, or another way to put that is, is uh, looking at it as, as a soil's buffering capacity with respect to that nutrient. So we can illustrate that with this figure here where we've got all of the, the stored nutrients or quantity here on the left and the soil solution or intensity factor here on the right. And it's important to recognize that the soil solution is always in equilibrium with the stored nutrient pools. So the concentration of nutrients in soil solution is controlled by processes such as dissolution and precipitation uh, from, the, from the soil minerals, mineralization, immobilization of organic matter, desorption, and absorption uh, of nutrients on the soil colloids. So as nutrients are removed from soil solution by plant uptake or, or leaching, they are replenished by <clears throat> this equilibrium uh, which exists with, with all of the stored pools. Likewise, when we add nutrients to the soil solution, such as in the form of uh, a soluble fertilizer, uh, they are, again, equilibrated with this, these stored pools, and, and a portion of those are sequestered into these stored pools. So uh, the one other important thing to, to keep in mind with this relationship is that this, this soil solution it is only a, a very small portion of the total nutrients. For example, uh, phosphorus is probably the, the, uh, the, the best illustration of this. We may only see in, in a very productive agricultural soil maybe four-tenths of a pound of phosphorus in the acre furrow slice of so the surface six inches of an acre actually in soil solution. While in these stored pools in our region, that, that may be a thousand to two thousand pounds of, uh, of total phosphorus in that acre furrow slice. So it's estimated that you know, this soil solution must be replenished you know, anywhere from three to four hundred times throughout the growing season for a typical corn crop. So again, this soil solution, just a, a small portion of this in this equilibrium is really important. So what's that mean for soil testing? Well. If I could design an ideal soil test, it would give us a measure of all of the nutrients here in soil solution, everything that's going to be immediately plant available, plus all of these nutrients in the stored pools and this buffering capacity, so the change in intensity with respect to the quantity. How's, how do the nutrients uh, equilibrate in that among those pools? Of course, the, the challenge is, is that it's that quantity intensity relationship is influenced by so many different factors. Uh, a few of those include pH and soil acidity, uh, soil texture and, and the mineralogy of those soil minerals, soil organic matter, and even temperature and moisture regime. We can look at uh, an illustration of that here with uh, a quantity intensity curve 
for phosphorus uh, with different soil textures, with here a, a coarse textured soil and a fine textured soil. A couple of things that, that we can look at here, you know, in a, in a, for a fine textured soil, it takes a, a much higher level of total phosphorus to support the same level of phosphorus in soil solution compared to a coarse textured soil. The other one, regardless of soil texture, you know, this relationship is not linear. It's it's more curvilinear. So down here on the lower portion of this curve, it takes a a much larger change in total phosphorus to get the same change in, in soil solution P than it does when we get to, to higher levels of phosphorus. So again, it's 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 not feasible to determine the quantity intensity relationship for every nutrient for every field where we where we want a nutrient recommendation, but Having an appreciation of this quantity intensity relationship and does does inform both how we analyze the soils and how we interpret the results. So, sort of a another way to put all of this, and and I think maybe maybe simpler, is simply with this uh, you know the fact that the, there's no such thing as a discrete fraction of measurable. Uh, available so soil nutrients. It, it just doesn't exist. It's not like we can say that you know this portion is available and and this portion is unavailable. Instead, uh, I think a, a better way to think about it is that nutrient availability is is more of a, a continuum, and that nutrient availability is based on conditions that affect the solubility of of each of these different nutrient pools. So when we look at soil test values, what they're actually representing is you know these nutrients that are and soil solution immediately available plus you know some portion of, of nutrients that we expect to become available over time and the other thing we can look at is the fact that different soil tests extract different portions of this and there there are a number of chemical reasons why but I think more along the lines of, of it's important to understand how we interpret those and, and that's where we're going with all this so there have been a, a number of different extraction solutions designed uh, for, for testing here. I've listed uh, six common soil test extracts, all for, for phosphorus. And each of these was designed for specific conditions present within uh, the, the region where they're, where they're used. So we can look at uh, you know, the, the strong acid extracts, like the Bray, the Malik-1, the Malik-3 weak acid extracts, the Morgan, modified Morgan, and, and the Olson, which is actually an alkaline extract. Uh, the Bray was designed for, for use in primarily in the, the north central United States, Malik 1 and Malik 3 uh, for the, the mid-Atlantic and, and southeastern U.S. The uh, Morgan and modified Morgan were designed and are, are still used in, in the New England states, and uh, the Olson used more for, the, for western soils. Um, the other thing I can point out just as a, as a side note here, each of these with an asterisk are, are what we call universal extracts. So these are not only used for, for phosphorus, they can be used for potassium, calcium, magnesium, and, and most of them will also uh, do a reasonably good job with the micronutrients. So we can look at each of these different soil tests and their ability to extract phosphorus uh, all on the same soil. I actually pulled this data from the, the North American Proficiency and Testing Program. This is uh, the program uh, many labs belong to to, to test their quality control. Uh, the proficiency program sends out uh, five soil samples each quarter, each of the participating labs, and I think there's well over a, a hundred labs currently enrolled in the program. Uh, we'll test those soils and then send back the results to the proficiency program uh, just to see how, how they're all comparing with everybody else's in order to evaluate our, our precision and accuracy. So this is a, a reasonably uh, very easy way to, to get a, a, a good measure of how each of these values or each of these extracts compare on the same soil type. And each of these uh, you know, bars here may have as many as, as 50 different uh, labs extracting that same sample. So I have a lot of confidence in that, that number. And you can see they range anywhere from 
a high for this soil of, of about 40 parts per million for Malik 3, all the way down to about 5 parts per million for the modified Morgan. So the question is, is uh, you know, which one's right? Well, they're all right. Um, I mean, these are these are about as accurate as, as values we can get. Uh, the real question is, is you know, what do the numbers mean? Um, and again, you know, what this comes down to is that these soil tests do not provide a, a, a quantitative measure of available nutrients. It's simply giving us an index of of nutrient supply. And our interpretation of those numbers is is based on the empirical relationship between extractable nutrient levels and, and crop response to applied nutrient. So now we're coming around to, you know, how do we interpret these numbers? And that's all based on research that's conducted on <clears throat> under local conditions, you know, within a given region, using representative soils that are, you know, of, of agricultural uh, and economic importance. And, and we need to make sure that we've got a, a range from you know, deficient through adequate for each of the nutrients that we're interested in, in order to develop these these uh, a correlation and, and calibration. We can look at conceptually what that looks like with uh, with this figure being soil test level versus relative yield, or relative yield is simply defined as the the ratio between the yield without any fertilizer, uh, for example, phosphorus, divided by the yield with a fertilizer applied with that nutrient. <clears throat> so, you know, for a, for a good soil test, what we want to see is down here in this below optimum range, we want to see this nice, uh, this nice relationship where we've got a, you know, a, a, a relative yield less than one, meaning that, you know, we, we expect to see a response to fertilizer all the way up until that flattens out and we're, we don't expect to see one. We can define that break point as the, the critical soil test level, simply uh, the split between responsive and non-responsive sites. Qualitatively, we can define these uh, the, the breakdown in this curve as simply below optimum under the critical level, optimum just above the critical level, and above optimum where we certainly don't need to apply any more fertilizers. So this is the, the generalizer conceptual illustration of what this looks like. Let's look at some real data. So I pulled this uh, figure from a publication summarizing some, some early work uh, from uh, Doug Beagle's career uh, working on, on calibration of the Malik 3 uh, test for, for Pennsylvania. In this case, this is uh, 67 site years for, for field corn. Um, and, and the first thing you notice in looking at this uh, this plot is that there is a tremendous amount of scatter there. And I, I think uh, a number of my colleagues uh, kind of cringe when I show this kind of data. And, and I, you know, it's understandable. Uh, you know, there's a lot of variability in there. Um, the the thing to recognize is that, well, I, I guess my message with this is a, it, it's important to appreciate and, and recognize that there is a, a good bit of uncertainty here, but it, it's also important to, to recognize that we take that into consideration when we make our recommendations, uh, we develop our interpretation system and, and make recommendations based on those. And it, it's through that type of process that we've gone through and, and identified, you know, the optimum range for everything from, from pH uh, extractable phosphorus, potassium, and in Pennsylvania, uh, even even magnesium, and the same process is, has been undertaken in, you know, every state, in, including Maryland. Um, another interesting footnote: I, I didn't have time to include it, but uh, I, I have looked at you know how we define these optimum ranges in Pennsylvania versus uh, Maryland, and they're actually quite similar, which is uh, which is good. <laughs> Um, but when we go out across, uh, you know, wide regions, you know, it is important to recognize that, that these optimum ranges do vary. Um, even when we're using the, the same soil test methods, um, the results may have a, a completely different meaning. For example, uh, to illustrate this, I, I pulled the optimum levels uh, from Pennsylvania and then just went west out across the Corn Belt all the way uh, over to Nebraska looked at how everybody else defines their optimum range. In Pennsylvania, it's, uh, you know, 30 to 50 parts per million. We get out to uh, 
Ohio, Indiana, and, and Michigan, this tri-state uh, system, they <clears throat> define it as between 20 and 60 parts per million, so a little bit wider range, but it, it definitely starts to drop. When we get out to Iowa, it's narrowed up even more. And by the time we get to Nebraska, their optimum range is 10 to 20 parts per million. So uh, the, the, the take-home message there is that uh, you know, a Malik-3 uh, phosphorus of 30 parts per million means one thing in Pennsylvania and something completely different in Nebraska. Well, it's important when we're, when we're thinking about interpreting our soil test results that, that we're thinking about it in terms of the, uh, where that uh, calibration data uh, was developed. The other uh, sort of confounding thing about soil test results is that not only do we, do we have different methods for testing soils, we have different units for reporting those results. Um, most labs uh, today are report results in element form in parts per million or milligrams per kilogram. Uh, but some labs uh, continue to use alternative units including uh, element form, pounds per acre, uh, oxide form like fertilizer equivalent values in pounds per acre, and even oxide form in, in parts per million as both potassium, calcium. Uh, we see the same thing for uh, uh, calcium, magnesium. Um, not a big deal. It, it's you know really it, it, we're all extracting the same thing. Um, we're just reporting it in different units, and and we can convert them all into uh, the common part per million form. Or as an alternative, some states have actually gotten away from uh, reporting these things on a concentration basis at all, and have gone to a unitless index system. And, and you know that's uh, that's the way Maryland has gone. There are a lot of advantages to that type of approach. Um, one of which is that you know, we can <clears throat> we can report everything in, in terms of its its relative availability uh, or relative level. So here are the uh, here are the the Maryland fertilizer index values and, and their corresponding interpretation for a low value would be 0 to 25, uh, medium 26 to 50, and then the optimum range is defined as everything between 50 and 100. Um, a couple of nice things about this is not only, you know, does it, you can look at the value and, you know, you immediately know what it means, but it's consistent. Uh, so it doesn't matter whether it's phosphorus, potassium, magnesium, uh, you know, we have the, this, we've put everything on the same scale. Um, the other great thing about that is that uh, and, and at least in Maryland, we can use either the, the Malik 1 or Malik 3 method, and each of these can be converted into the, the FIV units. And that's all summarized in, in this publication, which I'm sure uh, most of you are familiar with, with this uh, SFM4. Let's see how we're doing for time. Good. All right, so let's look at, uh, finally, recommendations. And, and here we're getting a little bit away from uh, the, the science and more into, uh, I, I won't say opinion, but, but I'll, I think we can definitely call it a philosophy. Uh, we've got three basic approaches that, are, that are, uh, have been used. Um, the first is the, the sufficiency approach, uh, also considered the, the feed the crop approach. And with this one, what we're looking at is a system where we're only applying nutrients when the soil test level is below optimum. And then we're only applying enough nutrients to, to meet crop need. Once we get to that, that, uh, that critical soil test level, no more nutrients are recommended. So even within that optimum range. Um, and we've got the, the build and maintain approach. This one's more a, a feed the soil uh, type philosophy. Here we're the, the, the goal is to build soil test levels up into the optimum range over several years and then just replace the nutrients that are removed with uh, removed by the crop. And finally, the, the cation saturation approach, and this one's based on the, the belief, and I should underscore belief, uh, that there is some ideal base cation saturation ratio. Um, for example, you know, 60 to 70 percent of the cation exchange capacity is, is saturated with calcium, 12 to 14 percent magnesium, and 3 to 5 percent potassium. Um, the cation saturation approach has, has never really been well supported by by the research, and and you know while there were a few labs that 
uh, that, that did promote the uh, this system, um, most of those have, have either fallen by the wayside or, or discontinued the use of the cation saturation approach. Most labs today use some hybrid of the, the build and maintain approach and the sufficiency approach, and that's similar for all of the, the land gap uh, recommendation systems. Let me illustrate that with uh, Penn State's recommendations. This is for uh, field corn uh, with an expected yield of 200 bushels per acre. This is just for uh, phosphorus. We can look at you know, <clears throat> in the below optimum range, uh, we're going to apply, we recommend applying enough phosphorus to meet crop removal, plus uh, some portion here in order to feed the soil in order to build soil test levels up to this optimum range. Once we get above that critical level and into this optimum range, we're only applying some portion of what we expect the crop to remove in order to maintain things in the optimum range. And then we've got a, at the top end of the optimum range, we, we cut the fertilizer off. And this is the, the cutoff point and the, the break point between optimum and above optimum. And Maryland recommendation systems work basically the, the same way and almost fall right on top of this. Um, same basic philosophy. Well, in just the, the couple minutes that I've got left, I um, just want to say a, a few words about micronutrients. And there at the beginning I, I said that you know, micronutrients may or may not be included in the routine soil test. And, and the reason why they may not be included in the Mid-Atlantic region is because we've never really been able to make much use of them. And the reason is, is because micronutrient deficiencies, not only in Pennsylvania, but throughout the Northeast and, and in most of the Mid-Atlantic, are, are pretty rare. Um, as a result, we've never really been able to, to calibrate our soil tests. You know, again, this is just a conceptual illustration, but you know, every time we've gone out there to to do any sort of micronutrient tests, you know, these response trials, uh, you know, that's pretty much what the the relationship that we find. There's there's we never see a a nice consistent response to to micronutrients. So whether we're talking about zinc or manganese, copper, any of them, um, and without having those responses of site, there's really no way to identify what that critical soil test level is. So you know, the question is, is the soil testing have any value whatsoever for micronutrient management in our soils? Um, I think it does, but I think it's it's just not as straightforward as the, the macronutrients. And while rare, micronutrient deficiencies do sometimes occur in our region. Um, and they occur under very specific conditions. So we've got an increased likelihood of, of same micronutrient deficiencies under conditions such as where we've got excessive phosphorus. Um, this is excessive phosphorus due to over-application of fertilizer P, not from manure P. Uh, usually when we apply over-apply uh, manure, we're also over-applying micronutrients, so rarely an issue there. Um, where we've got really low organic matter and or coarse textured soils and where we've gotten our, our pH up uh, too high. Uh, this image here on the right is actually of a, a zinc deficient corn plant uh, just down the road from me here, uh, a field that, that Dr. Beagle's worked in quite a bit over the last number of years. They, they actually have built houses on it just recently, so it's no longer a, a concern. But this field has all of those conditions and, and would commonly uh, present these, these zinc deficiencies. Um, <clears throat> So in terms of managing micronutrients, I think you know one of the most critical uh, things to keep in mind is, is that managing uh, soil acidity is, is, is really the, the key. And you know where we run into problems is we're, we're trying to manage soil acidity for, for most of our crops between six and seven. We do have, have you know, crops like alfalfa that prefer a, a pH closer to seven, so we're, you know, we're trying to push that pH up you know, uh, pretty close to neutral. The problem is, is if we over-apply just a little bit and our micronutrient levels are, are marginal, we can start running into problems. And, and zinc is a, a really good example of this. Um, so, you know, really managing soil acidity and getting nice uniform lime applications is, is, is really key here. And then monitoring it to make sure that we don't over-apply lime. So in terms of using soil testing, uh, 
for, for predicting micronutrient need. I, I think you know, where it's really valuable is, is identifying where the conditions are, are likely, uh, where, we're, where we're likely to see micronutrients. So looking at, at places where we might have a, a high pH or excessive P or low organic matter. We can also look at those extractable uh, micronutrient uh, levels, especially where we're using you know, something like a, a malic-3 extract. That malic-3 extract is, is really good for micronutrient measurements. Um, we can't use them to directly uh, predict uh, or, or determine whether or not we've got a deficiency, but we can compare them to you know, at least normal levels. Um, and the Penn State Agronomy Guide, we, we publish uh, the normal ranges for zinc, copper, and sulfur. Uh, that, you know, it, it, just observations that we've made here at the Agricultural Analytical Services Lab over the last uh, 15 or, or so years, and, and, you know, we've been able to define, you know, what's the, the typical level that we see for each of these. Not directly applicable to, to Maryland soils, but, but certainly a, a resource. Um, so we can use all of this information to, to sort of identify where we may see micronutrient deficiencies. But in order to really diagnose it, we want to we want to confirm that with, with plant tissue analysis. And I think uh, you know, hands down, plant tissue testing is is going to be the most definitive measure of micronutrient status. So as a as a diagnostic tool, we can use it to to verify uh, suspected micronutrient deficiencies. And you know, I, I think it's an underutilized resource for routine monitoring, or we can use it to identify you know what we call hidden hunger, where where we may have uh, nutrient deficiencies that that aren't expressing themselves, uh, you know, in, in visual symptoms, um, but are certainly holding back uh, yield and and can really be used to help, help I think uh, fine tune uh, fertility management. And I'm actually, looking forward to uh, Dr. Steinhofer's talk. Now that's my last slide, and I'm I'm finished up here at uh, 2:52. I think we've got a. Uh, Take a few minutes for, for questions. Anybody has any? University of Maryland. Hello everyone. If you have any questions, please type it in in the chat box to the lower right hand corner of your screen and uh, we will answer your questions. Are you going to work tomorrow? Question mark. Are you going to work tomorrow, question mark? I bet you no one is actually going to be working, considering it's going to be snowing all day if long. If you have not done so, would you please enter your full name and nutrient management certification number in the chat box? That way we can give you uh, proper credit for attending. No, comma, that's incorrect, period. It starts at 2 a.m. tonight. Yeah. Mr. Tharpa, that's an interesting question, and um, I think we have some folks from MDA in the seminar today. Uh, perhaps one of them could weigh in on this. I don't know whether in the past they've um, allowed modifications of recommendations based on tissue tests um, or not, but I think some of them uh, would have the answer to that.
can additional nutrients be applied? Oh, Um, the question is in the chat box, but I can go ahead and read it out loud. The, um, the question was, can additional nutrients be applied to crops in Maryland using tissue analysis results? 